Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, combined Gulf Cancer Conference with the theme of cancer care during and beyond crisis. Uh, we'll start the scientific program. And uh, uh, the first session is the preparedness and readiness for a healthcare crisis. Uh, pleasure to be with you on this great event. My name is Dr. Khalid Balaraj. I'm the Chair of Oncology Services in Tawam Hospital, United Arab Emirates. Uh, I will share this session with my colleague, Dr. Ali Al Zahrani, Executive Director of Gulf Center uh, for Cancer Control and Prevention, Senior Consultant and Principal Clinical Scientist at King Faisal Research, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. In this session, we will have uh, four eminent speakers and we'll leave the questions to the end of the session. Uh, if you have any question, please submit it through the QA uh, uh, icon on the screen and we'll address it later on. It's honor to uh, introduce the first speaker, Professor Amin Kashmiri. Uh, professor uh, uh, Amin Kashmiri is a professor of physiology at uh, Ummal Qura University, Mecca. He uh, trained in Germany and uh, UK uh, interested in pathophysiology and ethics, uh, participated in a lot of uh, chapters and different books. He had more than 30 uh, published articles. Uh, he will talk to us about the medical ethics and healthcare uh, practice during crisis. Thank you very much, Dr. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Amin Kashmiri greeting you from Mecca. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, uh, lending me the honor of participating in this a special occasion. I will be addressing a few issues on the uh, ethics of healthcare practice during crisis. I'm taking COVID-19 as a case in point. And so I'll just uh, uh, highlight the, uh, the issues that I'll be addressing during my talk. I'll start with the introduction, then ethical moral responsibility towards uh, the heroes who, who uh, managed to stand firmly during the crisis. And also I would like to address some ethical issues on the therapeutic prophylactic intervention uh, and also highlight unethical conduct by ethicists. I will do that voluntarily, to be honest. And uh, the fourth would be the patient triage. Uh, the last one would be how to be prepared for future pandemics uh, in, in an ethically sound manner. So the, the, with the introduction, uh, we all know that this, uh, this COVID-19 has, uh, has had its toll and hit uh, many parts of the world very harshly. And it did overwhelm healthcare systems until the, uh, to the extent that it did get out of hand uh, in, in many places. We in Saudi Arabia, we are, we are proud to say that we have done reasonably well as compared to uh, others. Uh, there are many factors behind this. The first one is the heroic effort exerted by healthcare professionals across the country. And they, 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 they deserve a salutation on that. Uh, the second factor would be cooperative attitude of the population in terms of uh, precautionary measures. The third factor is the uh, effort of the Ministry of Health in providing highly efficient testing process. And uh, having said that, uh, I must admit that there are uh, issues of ethical nature that need to be addressed and this, there are mishaps and pitfalls uh, along that line, which I'll be addressing along my way, inshallah. So the first one would be the ethical and moral responsibility towards healthcare professionals and their safety. We have known that it has, it nearly got out of hand, the healthcare systems with the, with the uh, tremendous impact of, uh, of COVID-19. And with that, also, human ethical conduct did get out of hand uh, reasonably uh, heavily, I should say. So we must admit that in, the, in, in order to prepare ourselves for the future. We are not blaming anybody. 
or reprimanding anybody. Uh, healthcare professionals themselves uh, ha have been uh, have fallen victims of this uh, tremendous uh, uh, phenomenon. Although the WHO drew attention to that in, in the principle, they put they F they, they published the, the guidelines to that effect, and these are the points that they published. Mainly that these uh, uh, healthcare professionals need to have appropriate personal protective equipment. That's important. Uh, and and uh, they, 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 they got to be available for duty. So the care, taking care of them would ensure that the society would be taken care of. And that's the link uh, of these guidelines of the WHO. Uh, it, the WHO also recommends that caregivers should be uh, adequately trained. And that's another issue that I'll be later on uh, addressing, uh, inshallah. Adequate PP, as we said before, and many other things that need to be uh, uh, given, especially to the healthcare teams. Now we wanted to verify whether we did abide by these guidelines of the WHO. In order to do that, we have conducted an opinion poll. Uh, this is uh, to verify these elements that I've just highlighted. Uh, it, it is sort of a benchmark poll. Uh, it has been undertaken targeting healthcare professionals in, in these cities, major cities in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have tried to avoid uh, what is called Bradley effect and the shy Tory factor. So we have emphasized an anonymity and obscurity. It's been very strictly observed. We have got good response, 91% from the number of people who are being uh, uh, targeted. And that constitutes nearly 20% of the targeted population. Uh, what are the questions that we posed to the participants? Here are the, the questions. That's one, number one. That's question two. That's question three. I'll not read that, I'll leave it to you to read it. That's question number four. Number five. And finally, number six. There are always uh, choices for the answer, either yes or no, or somewhat. Now we've got some results, very interesting results. As you can see, uh, the yes and no's and, and, and somewhat's, the percentage of each of them. So is there a shortage of PPE, training, uh, complacency, uh, any, any incompetent uh, phenomenon, cap capability of the, of the healthcare system. Uh, also, uh, diagnosing the reasons if the answer to question number four is yes or somewhat. And the final is how they've been informed, whether they've been informed by the uh, authorities that they will be facing uh, COVID-19 patients because we've learned that there are in some countries, the healthcare professionals were not being informed uh, what sort of patients they are facing. So we've, we've, we've analyzed the answers and we tried to comment on them. It seems to be obvious and evident that shortcoming, the shortage of PPE, that's evident. There's also we recommended that they should, in the future, there be strategic stockpiling of PPE. Now, the second question did show us that there is lack of training. And we've got, the recommendation is that there should be courses designed, verified and approved by the uh, uh, authorities uh, pertinent to them. Now, question three, showed us that complacency is evident. And we recommended that there are some rules to be imposed to counter the complacency in the future, that is. 
Question number four revealed that incompetence of the system is also evident. Uh, and th there is a recommendation for that, depending on the answer to question number five. Mismanagement and lack of expertise are also evident. That's what we've seen from question number five. So management is the responsibility of, uh, the ultimate responsibility for that is the Ministry of Health in appointing managers. Uh, the last question I think is fair enough because it, we've got 90% of yeses. The people who've been uh, taken to, uh, to face COVID-19 patients, they've been told openly and frankly what, what they are being taken to. So Minister of Health deserves credit and appraisal for this result. Now, applying off-label drug, this is another issue that uh, is of concern to all of us, particularly ethicists. Now, uh, the, I, I, will, I will highlight some of the uh, items on the Minister of Health protocol for patients suspected of or confirmed with COVID-19. Well, this protocol uh, was published and appeared on the on the, uh, the website of the MOH uh, on June the 17th, 2020. I, I, well, remarkably, Minister of Health highlights a disclaimer, which is quite unusual, to be honest, telling the people that this is a guidance, a living guidance, they call it, because it's subject to change as more evidence accumulates. It will be updated regularly, they say, and it will assist healthcare professionals, practitioners uh, to, to handle the cases that they are facing. Uh, and, and these are the points, the main points in the, in the disclaimer uh, of the Ministry of Health. Now, surprising unethical conduct had been spotted by ethicists. Being an ethicist myself, I must admit that these things happened. Now, no ethicist objected to the disclaimer per se. Uh, no ethicist objected to the fact that a protocol remained almost unchanged throughout the pandemic uh, period uh, while new evidence evolved. I'll, 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 I'll elaborate on that later on. Uh, some members <coughs> uh, were, were seen relentlessly advocating off-label drug use, uh, saying that they've been doing this uh, from their own experience. Uh, this is obviously in violation of ethical medical standards. Now, if that is being done voluntarily for, the, for appeasing someone, it is immoral. And if it's in response to a request by somebody, this is a sheer dishonesty. Uh, they need to, people who are dealing with bioethics in the country need to revise their policy and procedure. <laughs> there is compelling evidence of guilt. This is a case in point that we had, it has appeared in, in the internet many years ago what the charge is, somebody has been, has been uh, uh, taken in custody by the FBI at high noon time in a railway station in, 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 in the United States. Why, what has he done? He, he was advocate, advocating off-label use of medication. In the US, in the US there's been a, a, a relentless effort to, to prosecute individual physicians who do that. So there were nearly 150 investigations going on. Now, what we are seeing here, that there are committee members who are defending the attitude of that person who had been uh, taken into custody. Uh, it is inappropriate to use pictures of arresting blah, 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 as evidence for corruption. The man died in 2006. Ya haram, he died. So we need to have passion for him more than to the patients. Is that right? No, no, we have got victims. 
and we need to highlight this in order to uh, uh, avoid repeat, uh, repeating this mishap in the future. The perpetrator in the end by the jurist uh, faced that much of, of a penalty and the, uh, he committed suicide in the end in 2011. Although the, that committee member said he died in 2006. I don't know where he got that from. Now, the compelling evidence, uh, I'm just highlighting few, few, few lines of the, the jury that took place. Uh, the man pleaded guilty in the US District Court. So uh, because of all these uh, problems that uh, he, he is creating to the patients, uh, to whom he is advocating an off-label medication. <clears throat> now, an honest advice to fellow ethicists, thus I'm giving. Please remember telling every bioethics ethic, ethics committee member, you are the last fortress protecting patient safety. Uh, this honor is not reserved ex gratia for silent majority. Now, one of the first things that is, is uh, worth looking at is the use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. This also appeared very clearly on, on the uh, protocol of the Ministry of Health as from June 17th. So consider taking or using starting hydroxychloroquine and all this stuff. It's there uh, on June the 15th, two days before that, uh, the FDA announced on its website that they have revoked the emergency use authorization uh, to hydroxychloroquine. Now, now, remarkably, that has not been updated on the uh, Ministry of Health website. Well, this is unacceptable, ethically and professionally. Now, the use of glucocorticoids, uh, the ones of you who are, who are familiar with endocrinology uh, know what the effect of these glucocorticoids. And uh, it, it, this, the, these instructions were given on the 17th of June, despite uh, contradicting results uh, published in April already 2020. So the survival is, is being uh, challenged and high dose might cause associate, associated with death in patients and so on and so forth. Well, this appeared in the Allergy Clinical Immunology uh, Journal. Cortisone is known for its side effects. Uh, the main point is it does hamper immunity. So it is unacceptable ethically and professionally. Now the third one is use of this combination of, of medications. And again, uh, it, it has been published, uh, something has been published on, uh, on, on March 18th, 2020 at the New England Journal of Medicine that it does not significantly accelerate clinical improvement. So uh, this is questionable ethically and professionally. <laughs> also the use of this uh, combination of medications for the Ministry of Health is giving the, 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 the physicians at the front line all these precautionary measures to take or to undertake uh, or to proceed with uh, during facing hundreds of cases in, 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 uh, at, the high, at the high climax of the COVID-19 crisis. Now, this is the website where it appeared. And a question is whether doctors in the field uh, would have the time to accurately apply these precautions. That's a good question. Now using pro-inflammatory agents, some of you who are dealing with this, they might know what it does. And it, it, it has been conflicting uh, actions of these uh, uh, pro-inflammatory agents uh, as compared to the anti-inflammatory agents such as, such as cytokines. And this is not uh, quite appropriate, questionable ethically and professionally. Now we come to the fourth point uh, on, on my timetable. The first, al-farz is the triage. That if, you, if you've got 
an influx of patients and you've got a limited number of equipments and, and ICU beds, who takes first priority to use them? This is a very tricky question. And we, we've gone through that, uh, but the, the end, in the end, we deal with that through our Islamic Sharia ordained. What, what Islamic Sharia ordains is our meta ethics. So that is what I'm going to highlight right now. Uh, there's a, an ethical dilemma between the duty of and justice in providing care. Uh, there are some scholars who are emphasizing sanctity of human life. And two of them, Sheikh Abdullah Tregi, Min Ahl Zulfi, Allah Masih Al Khair, has written a, a, a good book on that. And also Dr. Talal Inqawi from Mecca has also written an excellent book on that. Here are the, the titles of the books. And Dr. Tariq Angawi uh, uh, elaborates on the principle of human life preservation. It is one of the uh, highly uh, regarded maqasid uh, al-shari'a, intentment of sharia. And it does draw on the hadith, al-muslimun tatakafa dima'uhum. There is the principle of justice. And what are the, the compelling, overwhelming reasons that dictate otherwise? We'll have a look at that. What propendrates uh, a, a patient over others? Well, that's what Dr. Tariq Angawi is saying. Ma'ayir al-Tarjih, criteria for uh, propendrance. Propendrance. Asbaqiyya. Residents, residents who comes first, get served first, or is it urgency, age, social status? Social status it doesn't mean richness or whatever. It just say, if you are a doctor, for instance, would that give you uh, a preponderant to, to take advantage? Uh, because you will be more useful to the, to the public than others. Promising prognosis is one of these criteria. Uh, if, if, if this, this, uh, uh, preponderance are equal, then it says resort to toss. Professor, this has never happened, to be honest. Professor Amin, you have one minute to conclude. All right. Uh, the final word is you should not, you cannot uh, uh, withdraw ventilators from patients. Well, how we get prepared for that? At the micro level, we do this and this. Not all, I think you, could, you have predicted what's going to be then. So that is at the micro level. Also, at the micro level, there are these things, respirators, respiratory therapists, and pulmonologists, and critical care, care assistance that should be uh, in abundance. These factors should be prepared for the future. Also, in the, at the micro level, we need to have these elements ready uh, for future events. Now, the one in the macro level, now never allow ethics committees to be under the auspices or the influence of bodies, especially those who, whose conduct uh, is supposed to be monitored by the ethics committee. Now, this is a recommendation. I know it's up to the decision makers to take and strategists. I'm just mentioning that out of uh, uh, sight for future uh, possible uh, uh, incidents. And so if we fail to achieve that, we might end up looking like this. Helpless kitten facing a gun. Thank you. <laughs>